But if we can have an openness or acceptance that we just are, are only ever going to know such a tiny, tiny, tiny bit um, about living organisms. But we can focus on trying to improve the, you know, it's sort of incremental. We learn a little bit, we shift, we learn a little bit, we shift. I feel like that's what all of nature does, right? Just learns a little bit and shifts as opposed to saying, I know with 100% certainty, if I do this thing, or if I change these five elements, or I focus on this one crop, it's going to be the answer for everything. It's just not true. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of the Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish organic crops that are grown in healthy soils and organic livestock raised on well-managed pasture. You just heard from Hannah smith Brubaker, a longtime organic farmer in Pennsylvania and the executive director of PASA, a Pennsylvania-based organization focused on sustainable agriculture and farmer-driven research projects. They are a worthy recipient of the federal Climate Smart funding. And so PASA is eagerly expanding their research projects and the results are already revealing surprises, as you'll hear Hannah and Dave get into in this conversation. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm pleased today to be talking with Hannah Smith Brubaker. Welcome, Hannah. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Hannah runs. Um, the sheep herd at Village Acres Farm and also is the head of PASA. So um, you're also part of the uh, pilot program of the Real Organic Project. Your farm was one of the very first farms to get one of that original 60 farms. Now it's it's 1,060, so uh, it's grown a lot in those five years. So Hannah, could you tell just a little bit, just to get a sense of of what life looks like what Village Acres Farm is like, and then what I'd really like to talk about today is the tremendous research project that PASA has done. Mm -hmm. but, but go ahead and explain a little bit about Village Acres. Yeah, so Village Acres is a 75-acre, highly diversified organic um, vegetable farm, and we also pasture Shetland sheep. We have pastured as many as 2,000 laying hens um, and occasionally do broilers. We got out of the hens, even though they're one of my <laughs> one of my favorites, just because we didn't have sufficient um, pasture for them, at least to raise them the way we really wanted to. Um, it's a multi-family, multi-enterprise <laughs> business. There we have cut flowers. Um, Two sisters are on cut flowers. We have organic vegetables, as I mentioned, and we do a lot of rotation of our grazing animals and our vegetables and cover cropping. That's sort of our you know, trifecta. Been in business since 1982 and have been certified organic since before there was a federal program. Great. Could you just tell me, I'm, I'm actually fascinated about organic chickens and pastured chickens because talk about a precious commodity that mm -hmm. is very hard to find, certainly in a store. Um, how much land does it take per chicken or per hundred chickens or per thousand chickens? Like mm -hmm. what's your ratio of the appropriate amount of pasture? Well, we actually moved them over about 25 acres so um in paddocks oh probably a quarter acre at a time and moved them every depending on the season every day to every three days and um we used a large movable shelter Stolzfus egg layer shelter, which is phenomenal. It's solar powered and has automatic curtains, automatic um, feeding, watering, and uh, 
but chickens can be really hard, especially if you're in vegetables. And so maybe you don't have as many perennial pastures, especially if you're rotating them through. They can be really hard. Um, we implemented about 15 acres of agroforestry in the last few years. And that has, we actually planted wide enough to pull the, the shelters through um, acre after acre. And that gave some shade for the um, chickens the way they like and windbreak. Uh, yeah, in the end, as I said, we got we got out of the egg business, but it was a phenomenal experience. And if I had a larger farm with a lot of perennial pasture, I would definitely do it again. How, how many how many chickens would be in that quarter acre paddock, just to give a sense of scale? Uh, well, at the height of it, we could have. 2000. Uh, now we probably, when we had 2000, we were running them in parallel quarter acre paddocks, I would say. Um, so maybe a thousand. Generally, as long as you're moving them really, really frequently, you know, their flock, <laughs> they, they, um, even if it was in a bigger paddock, they're going to be generally hanging out together. But when they're in their shelter generally is just for eating and sleeping. They mostly want to be outside scavenging, eating insects, soaking up the yeah. sun, dust bathing, doing stuff, chicken stuff. What, what was the impact on the land of having a thousand chickens on a quarter acre for a day and then you'd move them? Mm -hmm. Hopefully, what, what yeah, hopefully none. If we started to see um a lot of bare spots then that's too many for that area and we need to move them out of that area if if it's you know raining heavily they're often hanging out underneath the shelter they still want to be outside then there'll be a lot of impact so then there's maintenance there's immediate application of cover crop seeds um, which is our go-to if there are bare spots after we move the animals. How, how long would it be before the chickens come back to that particular quarter acre? Oh, M maybe, um, maybe only two times in a year. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, w and what percentage of their diet comes from, from what's growing in that quarter acre and what percentage of their diet comes from grain? Oh, well, they're probably eating um, a quarter pound a day. I don't know. With, with chickens, it's – my approach was always to give them the recommended amount of grain and then everything else that they, you know, they wanted at whatever amount they wanted. Um, it's – Usually not a good idea diet wise for hens to be just assuming they're going to get what they need um, from the pasture. They're just not bred that they need, they need the grain in their diet. Grain. And, and the grain was certified organic <laughs> or not. Okay. <laughs> so we had this ongoing, uh, so we do not, we did not have, we did not have our chickens um, participate in the Real Organic Project. We didn't have our chickens certified organic, and I'll, I'll tell you a few reasons why. One was we had a mill so close to our house where we could get really, really fresh feed. Um, it was GMO-free feed, but it was not certified organic. We had so much trouble getting organic feed. By the time it would get to us, typically it had to be shipped from the Midwest. Um, or, of course, you know, sometimes it's ultimately international. We, we, had is, we had issues with it for our chickens. But probably the bigger reason is it was a personal protest 
against the organic standards not requiring that hens be on pasture. Uh, I actually had a harder time explaining to my customers why a certified organic egg <laughs> didn't necessarily mean pastured than to just say that they're pastured hens um, and they're not certified organic and focus on the importance of being on pasture. So we were really careful with the Real Organic Project that we you know, always separated our, separate our eggs from our certified organic vegetables. Um, I would have loved to have been able to get local organic feed for our hens. Um, but that was the one part of our operation that we didn't certify organic. And it's very, very frustrating that to go, I could go buy organic eggs in a store and that hen maybe was never outside <laughs> versus a hen is living completely on pasture and um, not certified organic. So I, yeah. I, I could talk about that for a really long time. And yeah, it's. Let, let, let's talk about it for a little bit longer. Honestly, okay. it's a, it's a big, it's a huge issue. We know that over three quarters of the certified as organic eggs sold in America are coming from chickens who have literally never been outside in their lives. Right. So, and they're, and they're not just living in nice little chicken houses at a little farm. They're coming from huge egg factories yep. that, that they're just not what we mean by organic. And, and I think there's almost universal consensus about that, except for the, people who run those hen places, the politicians mm -hmm. and the lobbyists whom they fund yep. and the bureaucrats of the USDA who permit it. So it's a, it's a real uh, wound in, in the organic body, I think. So could you talk a little bit about, okay, so you're growing these eggs and these are happy chickens. They, these chickens are walking around outside, uh, a bunch of girls having a good time and were the eggs significantly different, in your opinion, in eating quality from the ones that were coming from a factory? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I can crack open one of our eggs. And of course, we still have our own little flock for ourselves, but I can crack open one of our eggs and it is thick. It is sturdy. It is. You can just see nutrition on it. Um and I'll crack open a, a store-bought egg, honestly, even certified organic, um, if they're not on pasture. And it's it's not a stand-up egg. <laughs> it's, it's very, very liquidy. Um, you know, of course, we know all the things like pastured eggs have a third of the cholesterol of, of eggs from, from hens that aren't on pasture that are solely grain fed. We also know that even with things like um, avian influenza, the importance of the role of solarization for health for hens. I know you asked me specifically about the difference in the eggs and what they look like. It no, used, keep talking. You know, it used to be that the egg color was a good indication but now a lot of organic houses put marigold, you know, maybe marigold in with the feed. Um, so sometimes the color can be similar. Um, but it's just, it's a different product. It's a very different product. And one of our studies at PASA, so we hadn't planned on talking about this today, but our nutrient density study that we're just getting started with um, on the veggie end is comparing the nutrition coming from plants that are part of the fields that are in our soil health study. But we're also starting to think about proteins as well. We have a lot of farmers 
that have pasture-based systems and starting to, to think about what does it mean to produce a product on pasture? What are the nutritional differences between that protein? And a, for example, confinement solely grain fed animal. This whole field is just ripe for ex exploration. People have done the work over the years, but not, um, I think not to the degree that our sort of on-farm citizen science uh, studies operate. So when you say citizen science, the, the, the work is being, um, I mean, the punchline is that lab work is being done to, to look at, at the nutritional content. Yeah. So uh, it's not, it's not a home chemistry set. No, 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 no. I mean, citizen science in the sense of, you know, farmers are doing, farmers are in our soil health benchmark study, often the ones taking the soil samples, we send them to Cornell for, for analysis, but they're very integrally involved in the research study. Um, we're not, we're not doing this on a research farm and we're not doing it you know, in an isolated lab somewhere. These are on real working farms that this science is happening. Yeah, that, that, that seems so important because the problem with the research often that is done in, in a university study plot is that either they don't really know how to do organic or they don't really know how to do chemical. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to have somebody who's genuinely expert in both and if you, and I've seen studies where they said, and this is the chemical plot, yeah. and this is the organic plot, and the organic plot is like a pot, you know, with some peat moss and 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 maybe some compost, <laughs> but it's it's yeah. not a soil ecosystem, or yeah. it's not a healthy soil ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. So when you get somebody who's doing it commercially, who's good at it, and then we evaluate the results. That seems much more telling to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and we find out so many surprising things, things that we didn't expect. In our, I know one of the things we wanted to talk about today was tillage. We never expected when we started our study and we're in our seventh year now, um, that For our farmers, there's actually a very weak correlation between <laughs> tillage and um, soil health. So even the farmers that are doing the most intensive tillage are demonstrating exemplary soil health. Why? Why is that? We did not expect that. We expected this sort of negative relationship that as the tillage intensity went up, the soil health at least the soil organic matter, you know, that there would be this negative correlation. And we just haven't found that. I'd love to show you one of the, one of the graphs where what we anticipated <laughs> and then this sort of like scatter of data that came out of it, very weak correlation. We also thought that surely the farmers that were doing the most intensive tillage um, who had high soil organic matter and good soil health must be, must be doing a lot of inputs. That wasn't necessarily true either. So what is, go what is going on here? I have a hypothesis about it. Please. <laughs> oh, bring it on. I... My hypothesis is that it's the same uh, what is what would be the word for it? It's like the same reason why organic farms, why sustainable agriculture farms thrive and can weather the variability that comes with climate change. It's the same reason why they, um, you know, their best insurance policy is diversity. 
It's seeing the whole ecosystem. It's not isolating. It's not monocropping. It's not one size fits all. It's not, this is the answer. This is how you do something. It's, this is my ecosystem. I observe it. I study it. I'm in it. You said something in your last email. Um, I'm trying to think what it was. It was like um, you were describing just like being in it, observing, being part of it, seeing yourself as part of that ecosystem. And so farmers that are using tillage who see their farm as an integral part of the ecosystem, see themselves as part of that, seeing their plants as part of that, seeing their animals, the water, the soil, are naturally observing, okay, as I'm tilling, what do I need to do to compensate for that disruption? But it's not a, okay, now I've discovered what works. We were talking earlier before the interview about we're constantly having to change our path, change our approach, learning, shift direction. And I think that is what an eco ecologically sound approach to farming is all about. Like seeing that whole system. Because in my mind, otherwise it doesn't make sense. You've got this sort of conventional knowledge that as tillage goes up, soil health goes down. And I think that might be true in a monocropping system. It might be true where the soil is very depleted. It might be true where we're sort of like towing the line and, and doing sort of what we're supposed to do instead of trusting that kind of observational scientist that so many of our farmers are. I could be wrong. That's like my personal, <laughs> that's like my personal hypothesis around it. Okay. Okay. But, but you are observing something based on the testing. Yes. So, that's true. so there are two things that you've talked about testing and I, I would like to go a little deeper on both, but let's start with soil health. What, what are you, what, when you say, well, the soil health is greater here, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. How do you know? Mm -hmm. What are you testing? For? So what we do is we have the farmer, or in some cases, you know, we have um, folks working on the farm take 10 samples from three different fields. So it's 10 commingled samples from three different fields. We send it off to Cornell. Um, and it's just a series of we're testing um, the chemical, biological, the, the soil structure, the ability to absorb water. Um, but with that, we're also asking the farmer to hand over a lot of their, their field records. So what has happened? What has happened in this field? And by studying what now we, we have over 200 farms in our study. Most of them are Pennsylvania, but we have a good number now in Maryland and, um, excuse me, in Maine. Finding similar results <laughs> in all those places. Um, And I'll just, as an aside, say with our, you know, we have this large Climate Smart grant now that'll be across 15 states from Maine to South Carolina, enrolling up to 2,000 farms in our study. We keep getting the same outcome where uh, whether it's an organic vegetable farm, uh, Actually, in some cases, a conventional no-till row crop farm, which is another thing, you know, to talk about, or a pastured livestock farm that 
where the farmers are approaching approaching what they do as sort of through the systems view. So it's everything from keeping the ground covered as many days as possible throughout the year. Of course, pasture livestock farms have us all beat <laughs> there. Um, right. So an organic vegetable farm planting cover crops the minute that, that they've, they've harvested or, the, or, or they've tilled. Um, or in the case of the conventional row crop farmers not disturbing the soil, that there can be very comparable soil health outcomes. And it's in the conversation with each other, again, that kind of symbiotic relationships that they start comparing notes. And so we've found um, that over the seven years, even though it was never an intention of the study, our certified organic vegetable farmers have significantly reduced their tillage. And that comes out of the conversations that they're having with the conventional no-till row crop farmers. And then we have these conventional no-till row crop farmers that are actually getting certified organic now. Why? <laughs> Why? That can only come out of that peer-to-peer -peer relationship, which to me is also sort of that ecosystems. Um, ecosystems Wonderful. approach. So you yeah, asked me, like you asked me a question I didn't t specifically, um, I went off on my, <laughs> my no, passion. No, you went off in a beautiful, beautiful direction. So that's so interesting. First of all, it's so interesting that there's a story being told that tillage is evil and no-till is good. And your study does not actually support that that conclusion. There is bad tillage, yes. no doubt, yeah. we all agree. Mm -hmm. And and I would say that at least some of us would say, and there's bad no-till, which is very heavily chemically dependent. Mm -hmm. and, and that that's not getting us where we wanna go either. But I love that that the organic tillers, who, for whom that's working successfully, for whom they have good outcomes are going, ah, oh, look at that, we could, we could avoid a tillage pass there. We could do this. We, mm -hmm. you know, so so we're all getting a little bit smarter. And the the no tillers are going. Oh, you know, I could not spray there. Yeah. And I think that, you know, just to just to give a bow to the regenerative folks that I know, the pioneers that I know of out in the Midwest, the the Gabe Browns and the, you know. Um, the Alan Williams, that they're really moving towards an organic model. They might not say that. They, they, <laughs> there seems to be some kind of cultural prejudice against the word <laughs> organic. But but that is, in fact, the kind yeah. of farming that's evolving. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, that everyone, as a result of these conversations, is becoming more thoughtful about tillage. Well, how deep do I need to till? Yeah. Right? It's a big question. Right. How could I till a little bit less? All of that. Mm -hmm. But... Your, your study is coming up with some pretty fascinating results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another application that we're just getting into now has to do with flooding and um, studying farmers' fields in reaction. You know, we have these like droughts that go seem to go on for forever. And then when it rains, you know, on my own farm, two, no, three falls ago. 15 inches of rain in three days. Um, or some of the farmers in Vermont right now, what they're um, experiencing. For every 1% of soil organ organic matter that we can improve on one acre of farmland uh, is an additional 20 thousand gallons of water that can be absorbed. So if we, if, if in Pennsylvania alone on our 56,000 farms, if we improved by one, 1% 1 the soil organic matter on only 1% of those farms, we're talking about 
billions of gallons of water that could be absorbed. Billions of gallons. So can can I ask you to explain to people who maybe aren't aren't conversant with this? What is that? Who cares, right? Okay, so so the the soil absorbed the water or didn't absorb the water. What's the difference? What's the impact mm-hmm. on the community? What's the impact on the rivers and the ocean? T- tell me, tell me, what does that mean? Why do we care? Well, um, I care because my farm is not being washed down <laughs> downstream, and I hope the person downstream cares because they're impacted by that flood water that's flowing toward them. And honestly, what they have to pay on their insurance bill. You know, we hear now that there are whole communities that, that can't even get home, homeowners insurance anymore because of the degree of flooding. And so the person downstream from me who I'm absorb, you know, my my farm is acting like a sponge and soaking up the water is not experiencing the level of flooding that they might otherwise. It's yeah. a simplistic. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Answer, yeah, but, but, for yeah. people to understand who don't live on a farm, they maybe don't see the gullies or the erosion. Just mm-hmm. to have a little sense of what that means that the when this is working well, the rain falls, it goes into the ground. It's held in the ground. It doesn't yes. just leach yes. through. And yep. so three weeks later, when it hasn't rained for three weeks, you've still got moisture in the ground. To exactly. Help it's not just the absorption, it's the retention. I mean, that's the great part for the farmer, right? It's not just the absorption. Right. It's like holding on to that water because we know that we know more drought is coming. So That's right. More flooding, more drought. Mm-hmm. Things are getting wilder and wilder. Um, okay. So to go back a few things, one of my, well, maybe the first thing to talk about is just the different kinds of cropping. You mentioned, of course, those people who are on pastured livestock have kind of the best setup in terms of soil health mm-hmm. because they, they've got pasture growing all the time. Yes, yes. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But they've always got living roots, lots of them in the ground. And if you're growing beef, that might be the easiest. Dairy might be next. Mm-hmm. So could you talk a little bit about that all the way down to the most difficult might be intensive vegetable production? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a little bit of, I, I, is it a rivalry? I'm not sure. <laughs> there's there's something that happens when we get all these farmers together and the um pastured livestock farmers, and many of them are in dairy in our study. We have, we have quite a few pastured dairy farms in our study. Um, they, yeah, they get to tout, <laughs> tout the results um, a lot. It is, um, there are definitely even organic vegetable farms in our study that don't have exemplary soil health results. Um, And there are a lot of complicating, you know, factors for that, but the certainly tillage, the mechanical tillage that's required for, weed control. Uh, I think that there are a lot of farmers, organic farmers, that just think that there's no, it's just not an option. Um, We had, we did it, I wanted to pull this up for you. We did a little survey with our, with our farmers who are in the study. And I wanted to pick the two responses that seemed the most divergent. And the first said, This past season was our first season with no-till. As an organic vegetable farm, I've held the belief that mechanical weed control was mandatory. Um, But some of the no-till farmers have worked with me, and I see where I might be able to reduce my tillage. Versus, and this is not going to be popular, 
But another farmer said last season was our our first year of organic farming with some tillage and cover crops. Prior to this, we utilized no-till traditional protocols. And it's going to be interesting in the next stage of this study to see how those two, how their soil health uh, progresses. But you're right. That other end of that spectrum, there are definitely some challenges when you have a very tillage intensive um, system, even when you have a lot of inputs. And then there's the whole other conversation about, okay, if you're bringing in a lot of inputs off a farm and it's a whole, whole other thing to discuss. Um, Okay. It's challenging. Just just so people again, understand when you say um, traditional (laughs) no-till protocols, you're talking about the use of herbicides, Mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of people don't understand that that's, what most no-till is. I, there is organic no-till and there's very skillful organic no-till. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful thing. But when most people, most farmers in the world are talking about no-till, they're talking about herbicides. They're talking yes. about glyphosate, round it up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's just part of that system, which is why we have Syngenta mm-hmm. and Bear Monsanto so thrilled mm-hmm. with promoting regenerative agriculture right. because for them, it means right. regenerative agriculture means right. no-till with herbicides. Okay. And and we can say that's that's okay or not okay. I just want to be transparent mm-hmm. about the conversation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, we do have, um, yeah, I'm not aware of any farmers in our study that, for example, are practicing organic no-till and implement, like, adding tillage into, into their system. I, I, I need to think about it. I don't think there's, I don't think we have that particular situation, but I'll, I'll ask our team. I suppose it's possible. The, it's more that people have gone from tillage to less tillage to no yes, tillage. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I'm guessing that, uh, I'm guessing that a lot of your no till is actually low till and that they, I mean, that they do some, I, I, I know that there are complete mm-hmm. no-till except for yeah. transition of sod or whatever, but mm-hmm. but uh, there's a lot of people doing just a little bit of tillage. Mm-hmm. And and I, I, I see the sun is like <laughs> in my window. It's okay. You're um, very angelic. <laughs> <laughs> and I... And by and large, I believe our no-till veggie farmers are typically using tarping, not rolling, because it's just, yes, very challenging to roll and then plant into it at any scale often. And, and why is that challenging? Because I've heard the same thing. I've, I've had a number of farmers tell me, does this rolling work? Because I can't get it to work in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And I'm just curious. So why is it challenging? Often, sorry, often it's, I hear it's weed control. Um, yeah. The weed control and actually getting, depending on if you're, you know, using a water wheel planter or how, how you're planting into it. Um, and depending on what you're rolling, actually getting that contact and getting the plant. And, and for people who don't know, the idea of rolling is you you roll, you you take a roller over a crop at just the right stage. So you the plants are just the right stage where rolling essentially kills them. Yes. And if you roll too soon or too late, it just doesn't quite do that. Exactly. And I think the timing, that timing, a way that our farmers have learned about that timing is because they're also submitting their, their field records to us. And then they sort of are comparing notes with the other farmers who are doing rolling. But mostly our no-till veggie farmers are doing tarping. So explain tarping, please. A couple of different ways you can do it. Um, you can apply an opaque tarp. Um, and that tarp might stay there for months um, to kill, you know, kill off 
the surface living matter, or you can use sort of a translucent tarp that through solarization is doing the same thing, but it's to not disturb the soil, but be able to kill the surface cover to be able to plant into it or, and, and to some degree it can become a mulch depending on how you're doing it. Well, it's, it's all a kind of plastic mulch. And yes, some true. of it is short term <laughs> and some of it is long term. I that sometimes with the black plastic like uh silage cover tarps, they might leave them on for yes. a month or two. Yes. Right. Yeah. If they've got a very pernicious weed and they're gonna yes. make it that nothing lives. And then some people use this clear plastic to right. raise the temperature of the soil and just just kill any seed that's right there on the surface. Right. Right. All right. Just so people understand <laughs> that 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 um, these are things that don't apply easily to large scale farms. No. I mean, no. if you've got a hundred acres that you're trying to not till, or yeah. five hundred acres, then dragging tarps around is is challenging. Right. These Very are most intensive market gardens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that's so when people are doing organic no-till, they mostly in your study, that's what they're doing is using clear or black plastic as, yeah. a, as a mulch for a little while. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We do have some larger organic veggie farms um, just starting to experiment with, with no-till, but yeah, they probably wouldn't be using, yeah, tarping. At any scale, at any level. Yeah. yeah, that was the experience out in, with the people out in California. The, the the three farms that were part of that Chico State study, mm -hmm. and um, they they weren't. I don't think they were judgmental of that technology, <laughs> but but it was just didn't fit their world. They, these were farms that were three hundred to fourteen hundred acres, right? And they were for techniques and they develop pretty pretty ingenious very slick low till techniques so they would just mm -hmm. till mm -hmm. a swath in a, in a permanent bed right. a 10 inch right. swath right do their their right. seating there mm -hmm. fascinatingly they had they had negative results um i yeah i was reading that i was reading that yeah why i i yeah <laughs> it's I'd love to have them, you know, sit down and talk to the farmers who either also are experiencing negative results or aren't and compare notes. Yeah. Yeah. They were so, I thought those farmers were so wonderful. They were so curious and I think courageous and idealistic. They absolutely thought this sounded like the right idea and they were trying to make it work. Mm -hmm. And at least, well, I think all three farms suffered some noticeable financial loss and one suffered a serious financial loss, like yes. a half million dollar setback. And uh, as he said, I just went too fast. Mm -hmm. I, I thought this makes perfect sense. And it did make perfect sense on paper, but it didn't in, in the real world. Right. And he's right. still trying to understand why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one of them told me that, that he thought the big problem, it's very dry there. So it's mm -hmm. a very dry climate. And the only water in the fields pretty much in the summer is the water that you give in irrigation. Mm -hmm. So when they would flail mow the cover crop, which was their, that was their green manure for the next crop. That's their fertility. Right. And it sat on the surface and it didn't degrade. It just mm -hmm. was a light mulch on the surface. And so the crop didn't get the nourishment right. from that cover crop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. As Bill said, maybe... If we did this for 10 years, then the whole system changes because you've got 10 years of that mulch mm -hmm. and it, it's a mm -hmm. different thing. So yep. he, he hadn't abandoned it, but, <laughs> but they hadn't worked it out yet either, not to mm -hmm. get what was for them an un, un, unbearable economic loss if they right. did their whole crop that way. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So in your study, the farms were making 
both work. They're making tillage work. They're making no-till work. Yep. Yeah, and and I do like I don't think you can underestimate the value of those in-person two-day <laughs> farmers sitting around a table at the end of the season comparing notes about what they did and what worked and what didn't. Um, so you've got the data. Every farmer gets a very individualized report um, and comparing them to their peers. And now we have enough farmers in it that we can all additionally compare them to their peers who have the same soil type or have the same practices. We just wrote a grant and I'm hoping we'll get it to look specifically at organic farmers. After seven years, we have a lot of data, um, but we don't <laughs> have this, you know, staff to do all of the analysis of all the different segments. Um, so we're really looking, we, we submitted a proposal and it's made it through the first stage and I'm really hopeful that it's gonna get funded. And I'll be sure to share those results specifically with you because when we can you. start looking, you know, by practice, by soil type, um, then you're getting into some really interesting comparative data. It, it, are you applying for the next round of Climate Smart funding from the USDA? I hope they have one. <laughs> I hope yeah. they have the next one. Yeah, I don't Good. know. Good. If they do, we will. Although I've we been, definitely have our hands full for the next five years. You, you've got a lot to work on. Yes, we Good. do. We do. Before we leave, I, I have I do want to ask about, about the nutritional studies. But before we leave this, do you have any? Uh, I guess w one question I had was we talked about inputs. We didn't get to go to that. Mm -hmm. Now I am an organic greenhouse grower, and I definitely have inputs. My basic input is compost. Mm -hmm. So I'm bringing the fertility of many acres to my very small acreage, right? And then I'm getting the yield of many acres. So it, it feels like a reasonable exchange to me. Um, but this is clearly, you know, this is problematic. Well, mm -hmm. it's fine to say, oh, you have an organic system that works very well, but where did the compost come from? Mm -hmm. So fair question. Mm -hmm. So uh, is that when you, how do you factor in that kind of input, either of hay, grain, or compost, when you're saying this farm is doing a very good job with or without tillage, but are you factoring in, and they brought in a bunch of hay from yes. somebody else's farm, yeah. or you brought in the, the grain from the mill down there, that's like mm -hmm. bringing in fertilizer, right? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and certainly if it's, if, it's, um, if it's not organic grain, then it's for sure bringing in Haber-Bosch nitrogen. Mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. it's, if it's coming from an organic farm, then we have a, an honest discussion about, well, is that mm -hmm. still Haber-Bosch nitrogen? So mm -hmm. what do you think? Mm -hmm. I asked a very bunch of complicated question there. Yeah, so I would like to discuss this with my team a little bit more. Um, sometimes they go a little rogue on me and do their own little independent <laughs> studies and analysis. I like to ask if any of them is looking specifically at this. Um, I will say that one of the sort of confounding discoveries is there also doesn't seem to be a strong correlation between whether bringing in all those inputs um, is impacting their soil health. So essentially one of the things I think we were finding out was you couldn't necessarily like cover up really poor soil health by, you know, using a lot of inputs. Um, although obviously does impact things for the better. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question, actually. I'm going to have to get back to you on that one, I think. Wonderful. Yeah. That will be our follow-up interview. <laughs> okay. When you're ready, when you go, yeah, we've looked at this. This yeah. is what we saw. It's a big question. Mm -hmm. you know. And again, in terms of um, not allowing these conversations to become too religious or or too marketing oriented, let, you know, let's actually look at, at what we're talking about mm -hmm. and what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Great. Yep. 
So before we go, mm-hmm. oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I was thinking about um, farms like, you know, Lady Moon Farms, Spiral Path Farms, Bo- both are in our study. Uh, Spiral Path, hap- you know, they happen to be in rural Pennsylvania terms, my neighbor. So there you're talking about a system where they're producing so much of their own uh, compost mulches. They're incredibly uh, prolific vermiculture (laughs) system. Just, I can't even describe to you this, enormous um, hut that, that, that they're in and their compost turning. Yeah. I, I think this would be very, a very interesting sort of spin off. How does a system like that compare in its soil health results to a farm where perhaps necessarily so a lot of inputs are coming from off farm and where are they coming from? Yeah, you got me thinking now. I'm definitely going to go back and talk to my team. Yeah. So at Spiral Path, are they growing most of the feedstock, like for the worms and for the compost? Yes. That, so yeah. that's coming from yes. off farm. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. yeah. And it's what Elliot's always trying to get me to do, but I go, I don't have any <laughs> land. But it's it's the right idea. It's, the, yes. it's what we would hope for. So thank you, Hannah. Before we go, you, you were talking about the studies that you guys have been doing about um, nutrition based on management practices. Did mm-hmm. I get that right? Yeah. So, so far, and we're really just getting started with this, another area where we're looking for funding. Um, we have just done the the tissue and fruit and veg sampling on farms that are already in our soil health benchmark study. So then that way we have the field records, the soil samples, the plant samples. And boy, I just, I feel like this is going to be our next really big, important endeavor because we know. uh, All right. I feel like I know there's no way that a vegetable produced, this would be, of course, a whole other conversation, hydroponically, soilless system. Um, I'm really curious to see those results, how that compares to something produced in a soil-based system where we have those, that soil analysis and um, the field records and see what's going into that plant. We, one of the early results we got, um, it was astonishing the, the difference in, if you use just a different variety of a vegetable. So for example, the, gold beet variety that a farmer was using, the nutrition was so much lower than the red beet variety. And that, again, that wasn't something we were looking for. It wasn't something that we expected. There's so many things that I think we'll discover through this process. It'd be very exciting for farmers to consider when they're deciding, you know, what to plant for the next season and that delivery of nutrition for their customers. We're just barely getting started with it. That's wonderful. Can I ask, what are the metrics you're using to evaluate nutrition? It's so complicated. We know this, that that I've had people say, well, you know, we test this on the major elements. I was in a a seminar once uh, from the Tuck School on the new technologies, the new food technologies. And so they were talking about an impossible burger kind of fake meat. And they said, you know, and we're really excited because we've tested these five secondary plant metabolites. Mm -hmm. And we found that by tweaking them, you know, we can get significantly better flavor. 
And I had a question and my question got voted in. So it got to be asked, which was, what about the other yep. 39,996 yep. secondary plant metabolites that we know about? Never mind mm -hmm. the probably 40,000 that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they might yeah. have some impact yeah. on nutrition yeah. and health? Yeah. Yeah. And they were actually stunned. They were like, please, we never thought of that. <laughs> we human beings have a lot of arrogance, I think. <laughs> we're very arrogant about what we, yeah, we've sort of decided is the next best thing or important or, in my mind, that goes back to, to our earliest parts of this conversation about whole systems. And um, one of the things I love about the farmers that are engaged in this study is their willingness to be surprised. And you said about not having this religiosity. I think that's so key. Once we start saying, if you do this, this will happen. Or if you look for this, you know, this is what's going to determine, you know, how healthy something is in the sense of being able to market it for those one or two or three aspects that, that I think that kind of arrogance gets us into a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble. But if we can have an openness or acceptance that we just are, are only ever going to know such a tiny, tiny, tiny bit um, about living organisms but we can focus on trying to improve the you know it's sort of incremental we learn a little bit we shift we learn a little bit we shift I feel like that's what all of nature does right just learns a little bit and shifts as opposed to saying i know with 100 percent certainty if i do this thing or if i change these five elements or i focus on this one crop it's going to be the answer for everything it's just not true yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So what are you, your metrics? What are you looking at for, for health? And I, I'm going to have to <laughs> to get back to you on that. For the next, <laughs> that's good. For the next conversation. Yes. I will send you the whole, the lab report and everything that we're focusing on. Yeah. That's all right. We'll talk about yep. it again. So, yep. all right. Hannah Smith Grubaker. Um, thank you so much. This Absolutely. Has been a great pleasure. Yeah. And you're doing great work down there in Pennsylvania. Thank you. The rest of us are really appreciate it. Keep it up. Thank you. I want to take the time to thank you for listening to the Real Organic Podcast. This movement is growing because so many of you are subscribing and sharing these podcasts with your friends. So keep it up and leave us a rating and a review while you're at it. As always, you can find a video version of this interview at realorganicproject.org or on our YouTube channel. And join us next week when we'll be hearing from Steve Ela, a fourth generation Colorado fruit farmer, organic research advocate, and a former member of the National Organic Standards Board.